Welcome, Amy. It is so wonderful to, to be together today to talk about your art, your process, uh, creativity, the Made in Hand exhibit. Do you feel joy when you work with your hands? Really great question, and of course I feel joy. I am so in the zone, uh, is what I've often referred to the space of pleasure that hits every pleasure center when I'm really getting into something that's creative and finding my groove and kind of getting deep into the work with my hands. So 100% I feel joy. Do you identify as an artisan or an artist and why? I identify as an artist and you know this has been the age-old question ever since my education. It's been a topic of discussion this artisan, artist, crafter, artist, dialogue and discourse that's going on. And so obviously I, I've spent a lot of time over the years grappling with it. It hasn't always been a pleasurable experience and it's felt, you know, kind of like, do I have to be one or the other at times? But I would say now that I've come up with this um, visualization, being a visual artist, I think that the, um, the metaphor of a teeter-totter is a really good one for me to kind of make sense of this. And I think of a teeter-totter and I think of artist on one seat and artisan on the other, and then put a marble. You are that marble in the middle of that teeter-totter and your teeter-totter is actually going to move up and down. For me, this is my, my personal feeling around it because I am very skill-based, I'm very technically based. I like that process of, you know, getting something, learning a skill, mastering it, working towards mastering it. It's not always an easy process, but I like that struggle and I like the end result that comes of it. It's a very satisfying feeling when you get good at something that you really want to do. So that to me is an artisan. I also think that um, like many other artists have answered this question and historians, it's to do with concept often with the artist um, alignment. So I feel as though I'm so drawn to storytelling and reason and my education was very rooted in defense of why you do what you do. And, you know, it is a message to the public. It's a big responsibility to be an artist, you know, so you have the opportunity to tell a story, you have the opportunity to be political, you have the opportunity to be um, a big voice that can express something through your work. And so I really feel that that type of concept and responsibility is in align with artists. So people that work with that kind of um, understanding would, would be more on the artist side. But I also show in craft fairs and seasonal fairs. I love being a part of fabulous finds in Cologne every year. And I love selling my work at the Ponderosa's annual Christmas sale and holiday sale. And, and those opportunities over the years have been so rewarding and confidence building that, you know, I will continue to be aligned with that. You know, so it's it's definitely a marble on a teeter totter, and it rolls. What yeah. a beautiful metaphor! <laughs> Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about your artistic process, practice, and the pieces that you have made for them, made by hand to show? So I have a piece that was made not long after my daughter was born. So it's uh, 2012, 2013, I think is when I made this piece and Maggie would have been uh, one years old. And I call it um, same but different. It is a tapestry and it is very, very thick felt. And what I did was I made a long banner um, using all kinds of breeds. And I was really exploring some breeds that I had never used before really long-haired breed, Merino, Corydale, um, Romney, and probably another eight breeds of wool as a base for this piece, making it very structural. And that's what I was looking for was this thickness that would allow it to really have a stiff feeling, like almost like a painting in wool. So I did that and then I created shapes, uh, cut them out, um, half belted them so that they were in the middle of their open 
um, form, which wool, when you're working with it and doing wet felting, it goes through this process of the barbs opening up on each fiber. And then um, that creates the opportunity for them to then get entangled and mat, creating a really strong end result, which is a, a solid mat. So I played around with shape, color, texture, all sorts of things. And the process was quite long. The piece took about three weeks in total because I built up a lot of that preparatory shape work beforehand and then did the cutting out and working through the concept of ideas around what, you know, the body goes through during a pregnancy. I also did a lot of concept thinking around nature and just really digging into ideas about shape form and how I can speak through my materials and the shapes that I'm working with to express body, nature, and those types of connections. In the work, you'll see that I've got similar things. That's why I put my sculptural vessel here, which wow. I did in a workshop many years ago. And in the wall hanging, you'll see that I have these, what I call design elements. And so they're openings that are created. And so I was able to install a little resist material under layers of wool. And then after it had felted a bit, I could actually cut open and remove the resist, creating this opening. Also emblematic of parts of the body. So mouth, maybe an eye, belly button, other things like that. I also did uh, some um, spikes. And on the, on the piece in the art gallery, same but different, I've got ponytails where I've wrapped little pieces of unfelted raw wool to create that um, very symbolic pair on the piece, which you see a little bit of that here with another ponytail with the hair coming out that's not felted. And you'll also see that I've encased some marbles and little pebbles wrapped in felt and then tied tightly with elastic bands in the piece. So that's another feeling of texture and the body just giving you a lot more to work with as a viewer and an, and an audience participant when you're looking at these types of things. And then lastly, this element here, it's called the accordion. And, and I learned how to do all these methods with one of my very influential teachers over the years, Andrea Graham. And this one here I thought um, played well in the piece in that it showcases sort of folds and skin. So I really wanted to create those kinds of feelings in the work that showcase the body in a really abstract way. So it's great that you're asking me about it because I get a chance to talk about that experience. It's fascinating to, to hear the, the technical aspect of, of creating them. I think some people will be interested in how do you do that? You know, it, it looks so interesting. Yeah. And, and I love the idea of you having many new types of wool and, and in order because I mean going and having a child and, and you're representing the, the parenthood and having having a baby, that's new. So you're you're right. kind of paralleling the process metaphorically with with tr new fibers, you know, new experiences, new life. That's exciting. Yeah. And to further that even, it was, you know, felted as one large piece and then cut. So it then created the two separates. Mm -hmm. And that's why I sort of, at this stage, I'm referring to that piece as the same but different. So it's just got so many layers in there in terms of the concept of where that came from and the journey that it took to um, develop a piece like that, so. Yeah, it's really rich. When you make a piece, have you decided designed it in your mind's eye first? Another great question. And I will say absolutely <laughs> to that one because I am a methodical person by nature. I am very steps oriented and I like to work out a lot of those details so that when I get to the place where I'm ready to actually launch into creating a work of art, I like to have my business plan, my art plan prepared and ready. 
of course there's going to be cases where that's going to go awry and I'm going to be hitting stumbling blocks and you know solid brick walls along the way but if I can figure out um, you know generally the size the scale scope a lot of those technical considerations for me is a big part of it especially being a process-based artist and that's another thing that I refer to myself as somebody that really connects with the idea of working through processes in my work. So yeah, it's absolutely planned. I do sketching, but a lot of it is in the mind's eye and just, you know, waking up sometimes in the middle of the night, even resolving issues or, see, you know, the light bulb moment where it's like, well, actually I'm going to need a way, you know, bigger amount of this to accomplish that, or I'm going to, you know, really need to work with these colors to achieve this kind of an outcome or, you know, those types of things. So there's a lot of preparatory work in the mind for sure. I think I'm attracted to meaning and storytelling and, you know, why people do what they do. It's really what draws me into art. I'm wondering about, you know, preconceptions about artists and artisans. Do you feel that one is kind of placed a given more value in our culture? Well, I do think that in the academic and perhaps, um, you know, fine, let's say public and um, private gallery space, there is definitely a, a side where there is more credit given or, and it's really to do with money or process, I think. It depends on how you perceive and define the values that you have based on what your, you know, your education and background is. And for some people, it's very important to align strongly one way or the other and to put a line between the two. For me, I don't necessarily feel that that line has to be, you know, a black and a white line. To me, I feel as though they cross over. I really like that. I think it reduces the us and them. Yeah. Is. I mean, often creating a, a you and me or an us and them often divides rather than unites people. And I, I agree. I, I think that's a really nice way of, of feeling that it's a continuity and a flow that mm -hmm. isn't distinct or black and white. Yeah. And I think, you know, material use um, over the course of art history has changed. And a lot of the things that were once deemed more of craft material or artisan material are genuinely now exhibited in very, you know, large scale museums and galleries, um, you know, being sold for very expensive amounts of money. So I think that that, you know, the dialogue and, and the material breakdown is evolving. This is yeah. an evolving thing. So, mm. and I, I do think that the materials, I mean, the, the relevant part is where, where voice is found. Yes. And, and, you know, finding another language to express voice, but voice um, is, is movable with time and, and evolves. And, and yes, it can move into other areas that may have been previously craft. But yeah. the voice, um, having the voice and, and the power of the voice is why, where art contributes to community. Well put, Pippa. That's totally exactly how I feel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think community can um, will receive the voice in different ways. And maybe, maybe, maybe our culture gets tired of hearing voices in one way and having a new dynamic medium is, is you know, moving forward and, and easier to hear. Who knows? So I wonder where, where it will go next. I figure the conversation will definitely continue. <laughs> <laughs>